have these coming up. I just have to show you something. How many of you know I'm a prolific note taker? See, see, I have pa yeah, at Amariah. I have pages and pages of notes that look like this from each of the speakers. This is Brian Gearns. Does anybody know why my page looks like this? It, it has a couple, it's half a page. I have about uh, four to eight pages on every speaker. Brian got up there, gave a few prophecies that the Lord had given him, and the Holy Spirit hit him, and he couldn't move off of the pulpit, and the Holy Spirit just hit the whole place. Amy and I had our own time in the seats, but go ahead. Yeah, I I actually watched Brian Guerin's thing back, and it was literally exactly 10 minutes from the time he actually got the mic to the time where he couldn't talk anymore. <laughs> That's how short it was. So this is the Jesus 19 recap, and I wanted to play this for you guys, just so you guys could get a glimpse of what we were in. Oh, guys, I used to say no to so many things because of my religion. Now I say no for love. Now I say no, now I say I can't hear that because it hurts my Jesus. And now I say I can't watch that because it hurts my Jesus. I've had many times in my life where I feel my heart is getting hard towards the Lord and life is crowding me in and there's so many things going on. And all of a sudden, from the inside, a love begins to burst up and say, no, I will go be with you. I will shut down whatever I've got to shut down. Let everything fall if it may. I'm going to be with you. And I don't care if stuff falls through the cracks or people don't like me. I will be with you, my God. I will set it out. I'll block it out. I will make room for you. I believe today God wants fire to fall, calling down fire to save people, calling down fire to purify people, calling down fire from heaven. The moment is now when God is looking for a people upon whom he can put his spirit, a people who will go, they will preach, they will give, they will lay down their lives. We give the devil too much credit. The devil's got no clue what God's about to do in your life. He has to be everything. He wants all of your heart. He doesn't want just a little bit of your heart. He wants all of it. He purchased you in his blood. The Lord dwells there. The Lord's looking for habitations. The Lord's looking for those that will pay attention to him. But the devil has sold the church a lie that you need to apologize to the world for the good news that you have. No, you don't. You need to turn up the volume. The lion, the lamb, the shepherd, our wisdom, grace, fire, the dove, the king, the sufferer, the savior. Jesus is front and center. And you no longer are. Wow. <laughs> so uh, that's... That's what we've been immersed in the past couple of days. Um, one of the, uh, the, what Stephanie Gretzinger said at the beginning, I wrote it down. It's just marked me. Uh, I used to say no to so many things because of my religion. Now I say no for love. Yeah. I can't listen to that because it hurts my Jesus. I can't watch that because it hurts my Jesus. Are we in love with him? Are we saying no to stuff? Are we even saying no to stuff? But if we are saying no to stuff, are we saying it because of our religion? Are we saying it because we are in love with him? Because we'd rather be with him? I realized, like Amy, a couple weeks before I went to this, that my heart had become numb to the things of God. That I was just, I was so used to it that I, I just... I hadn't cried, and I was like, God, you need to help me. You need to tenderize my heart once again. And that's what he did during this conference. And I just, I'm so thankful. And 
One thing that Eric Gilmore said is that dry eyes often mean a dry heart. When's the last time you cried before him? When's the last time you came to him for him? Sometimes we are more obsessed with trying to fix our problems than beholding Jesus. When he's the only one that can fix them anyway. Plus, what, what, what honor it is to, when we are suffering, to worship him in the midst of it. We will never get that opportunity again. When we are in the midst of our problems and we choose to worship him, that is the greatest honor because in heaven there is no more suffering. There is no more tears. So the worship we give now, the sacrifice of worship, is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. A lot of times we are busy trying to fix our family, our anxiety, or our finances. And he's looking at us saying, come to me, behold me. I will solve all your problems. Just behold me. He's, he's looking at us and he's watching us go through our days. And he's like, are they going to remember me today? Are they going to look at me today? Are they going to spend time with me today? He's looking at us. He's just peering at us like saying, come be with me. And we say, God, I have to, can you do this for me? And he's like, yes, but come be with me. His power, hold on, let me see if I can get this. His, the power reveals what God does, but the presence reveals who he is. A lot of times we just go after his gifts and what he can do for us and his power. And yes, that's what he does. But we need to go after his presence because that reveals who he actually is. We need to know the king, our bridegroom. I realized that I wasn't, whatever has the most of your attention is what you're worshiping. I'm going to say that again. Whatever has the most of your attention is what you're worshiping. And it's not, not here, like in church, like, oh, yeah, I'm focused on him. But it's when nobody's watching. What has your attention when nobody is watching? I realized that I was spending all my time doing meaningless stuff, whether it was on social media or just watching TV or just, like, wasting my day away. And I wasn't spending time with Jesus, which I was... I was cheating on God. I was looking for love and affirmation and rest and joy and peace everywhere but him. Lukewarmness happens when Jesus becomes eclipsed. I'm going to say that again. Lukewarmness is what happens when Jesus becomes eclipsed. When he's not front and center anymore. When you have other things that are better than spending time with God. And a lot of time we don't even realize that we're doing that. When he no longer has your attention, when you can start, when you start to think that you can do it on your own, like I got this, like I'm doing pretty well, and then you start to forget about him because you're fine. And when we realize that we need Jesus even when we're doing well, like he's so important, like he's the one that gives you life. He died to save your soul. Even if he didn't answer another prayer again in your life, he died to save your soul. Like, don't you think he's worth our time? He's worth our attention and our love? The number one reason people don't want to marry Jesus is they don't want to forsake everything else. He needs to be priority. He needs to be our all. To stay faithful, you must stay in love. To stay faithful, you must stay in love. We need to be in love with him. Otherwise, we'll start looking other, way, other, other places for love, other places for affirmation. We're looking to people, and people disappoint. And then we get hurt, and we, like, we say, God, why did you let this happen? And he's like, if you just behold me, if you just come to me, when we come to him, everything, nothing has competition. We stop comparing ourselves with other people. We stop comparing our lives with other things. Because he is priority. When a husband, and all, all you have to do is ask. Like, I, I, 
I ended up just saying, the beginning of falling in love with him again is just saying, God, help me to love you again. Like, that's, that's the beginning. It's like, you don't have to automatically just, like, say, okay, I'm in love with you. It's like, God, help me to love you. And he will. And you don't have to do, it's not about works. It's not about doing everything perfectly. I love this example. When a husband marries a wife who can't cook, so they hire a maid, who does the husband love more? The maid who can cook or the wife who is in love with him? He's not after what we can do for him. He's after our hearts. He wants us to love him. She's going to play a video later of Daniel Kalenda that's stealing half of this. <laughs> but it's amazing. Um, and if you say, I don't know if I'm in love, then you probably aren't. Being in love looks like something. Do you think about him? Do you talk to him? Do you want to give him everything? She said that I went up for Daniel Kalenda's local. I went to pretty much every altar call. But just, just because you... S- when you're in love with him, you want to give him everything. Even though I've, I've given him my life, I just found myself going up and being like, God, I want you to have everything. Um, do you cry when you hear about him? Is your heart moved when you read the scriptures? Do you talk about him? We can't help but talk about what we're passionate about. Whether it's movies, music, the latest trend, the mascara that we love. <laughs> what are you talking about? What, do you, what fills your mouth? Like what, when you're talking to people, when you're trying to make conversation, are you talking about him? Are you sharing him? Because when you're passionate about something, you will talk about it. <sighs> oh, I need to look at the scripture. I didn't write it down. First Peter. You guys can turn in if you want or not. I'm going to read it anyway. First Peter 1. Oh, I just turned to it. That's cool. <laughs> it literally flipped over my Bible and there it was. <laughs> First Peter 1.18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. Like, wait. No, First Peter 1.17. And if you call on the Father, who without part, partality, partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay. Okay, 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver, silver or gold from your aimless conduct r- received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish or without spot. Daniel Kalenda read that, and he pointed out that it says we are redeemed from aimless contact, from wasting our lives. That's one of the things we are redeemed from. Yes, we are redeemed from sin and from death, but we are redeemed from a meaningless life. When God, when you give Jesus your life, your life has purpose now, but if you live it According to your ways and according to the world, and according to what you want to do, you go back to aimless life. Like, we, are, we have this opportunity to live for Jesus. We have nothing without Jesus. He is everything. And I realized... I love this. It's not, when, I, when I'm at this conference, it's not about watching people who inspire you. It's not, it's about falling in love with the Jesus that they are obsessed with. I'm going to say that again. It's not about watching people who inspire you. It's about falling in love with the Jesus they are obsessed with. The last session, I watched Michael Culianos talk about Jesus. And all I could do is weep because... I could see that he is so in love with Jesus. Like you just see these people and the way they talk about him and the way they know him. You just see that they are in love with Jesus. And I'm like, God, I want to be in love with you like that. And I just wept. And it's 
our hearts need to be tender. If you don't feel, if you don't cry, if you don't know him, if you don't want to know him, if you don't want to spend time with him, then you need to say, Lord, please tenderize my heart once again. Because it's so easy to become numb to the things of God and live life just going day to day, just, I'm okay, I'm fine, I'm doing well. Like, we need to be in love with him. We need to be obsessed with him because he's the only reason worth living for. And I'm going to end with this, this quote. It says, Lord, make us a resting place for you, not just a visiting place.